We're going to go ahead and start. Um, I want to welcome you all again. My name is Dita Bargava, and on behalf of Beacon and Maine, I would like to thank everyone for being here tonight. We are delighted that we could bring you this very important discussion with our incredible panelists. Thank you, panelists, for making out the time and your busy schedules for joining us today. And, and a very special thanks to Yale Macmillan Center for sponsoring this event. Our organization, Beacon in Maine, started out as an online community of diverse socioeconomic backgrounds across the state of Connecticut that shared a common desire to protect and strengthen our democracy, our democratic values, and our democratic institutions. We are a community of individuals that felt compelled to protect the civic, legal, and economic progress we have made as a country over many decades. My co-founders, Juliana Hess, who's the CEO of Beacon and Maine, Erica Rogavine Byrne, Kate Hamilton Moser, Tamira Wilcox, and Ea D. Simone, along with other partners and a wonderful group of volunteers, launched Beacon and Maine. We have engaged an online community of over 10,000 people statewide to press forward common ideals of equality, mutual respect, and personal freedoms. Beacon in Maine is a forward-looking organization whose mission is to illuminate economic strategies for the common good. We believe that bold policies will advance the well-being of our diverse communities and ensure a healthy environment conducive to positive economic development. Thank you all again for making our inaugural event an auspicious one. I would li now like to give you a brief introduction to our panelists, and then we will move right into our discussion. <coughs> governor Daniel Malloy began his second term as governor of Connecticut in January of 2015. Later that fall, extremists carried out a series of coordinated violent terrorist attacks in Paris, France. The attacks inflamed public fears of terrorism in the U.S. and sparked a wave of anti-refugee and anti-Muslim proposals by local, state, and national politicians. More than half of the nation's governors declare that in the current security climate, Syrian refugees would not be welcomed in their states. Governor Malloy could have chosen the politically expedient course and remained silent on the highly charged, controversial issue of refugee resettlement and national security. Instead, just three days after the Paris attacks, and in a direct challenge to those calling for the U.S. to close the doors on Syrian refugees, Governor Malloy announced that Connecticut would continue to accept refugees from Syria, and he has kept that promise. In 2016, Governor Malloy received the John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage Award for his defense of the U.S. resettlement of Syrian refugees. Welcome, Governor Malloy. Rebecca Heller is a visiting clinical lecturer at, in Yale at, law, at Yale Law School. She graduated from Yale Law School in 2010 and received her BA from Dartmouth College. She founded and directs the International Refugee Assistant Project, also known as IRAP, at Yale Law School, an organization that assists refugees in applying for resettlement from abroad and adjusting to life in the United States and she launched subsequent chapters at UC Berkeley, Columbia, Stanford, and NYU law schools. Her student internships included working in the immigration unit of the New York Legal Aid Society and in the Worker and Immigrant Rights Advocacy Clinic. IRAP has helped to resettle over 3,200 refugees and their families to 14 different countries with an 85% success rate in resettlement cases. Welcome, Becca. Justin Cox is a staff attorney for the National Immigration Law Center, NILC. NILC is a leading U.S. organization dedicated exclusively to defending and advancing the rights of low-income immigrants. Their work has helped inform innovative policy solutions to address immigrants' access to health care, workers' rights, and legal status for immigrant youth. Justin has litigated cases involving unlawful immigration raids, unconstitutional and anti-immigrant state laws, and is currently involved in legal action against President Donald Trump's Muslim ban executive orders. Prior to joining NILC, Cox was a staff attorney with the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project. Welcome, Justin. Mushfiq Mubarak is a professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. 
He is a development economist with interests in environmental issues. Professor Mubarak conducts field experiments exploring ways to induce people in developing countries to adopt technologies or behaviors that are likely to be welfare improving. His ongoing research projects are in Bangladesh, Brazil, Chile, India, Kenya, Nepal, and Malawi. His research has been published in journals across disciplines, including Econometrica, Science, the Review of Economic Studies, the American Political Science Review, and Demography, and covered by the New York Times, The Economist, Science, NPR, Wired.com, The Times of London, and other media outlets around the world. <laughs> Professor Mubarak is currently working on research which will highlight the economic impact of immigration to our society. Welcome, Professor Mubarak. Chris George has been the Executive Director of Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services for the past 12 years, a New Haven-based refugee resettlement agency that welcomed 530 refugees to Connecticut last year. Chris has spent most of his professional life living in or working on the Middle East. Before returning to Connecticut in 2004, he worked seven years in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Chris directed a legislative strengthening project with the Palestinian Parliament and later established an emergency assistance program for Palestinian nonprofits. From 1994 to 1996, Chris was executive director of Human Rights Watch Middle East. Prior to that, he worked with Save the Children for nine years, mostly in the West Bank and Gaza, and three years with the American Friends Service Committee, mostly in Lebanon. Chris began his international career in 1977 as a Peace Corps volunteer in Muscat, Oman. Altogether, he spent more than 16 years living in the Middle East, learning and fluently speaking Arabic. Welcome, Chris. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Bushra Mehdi came to the United States as a refugee from Iraq in 2014, along with her husband, Shakir, and their four children. Bushra operated her own business as a, as a clothing designer in, in Baghdad before she and her family were forced to flee to Jordan. After arriving in the U.S., learning English became Bushra's focus as she worked with New Haven tailors and designers until opening her own business again, Bushra Designs, and becoming an active contributor to Connecticut's economy. Welcome, Bushra. All right, we're going to jump right into our question, and, and the first one goes to you, Governor Malloy. I would like to read you a recent quote from Jeffrey Sachs, who is the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, the senior UN advisor. He said, right now, everyone is saying, we don't want these refugees. We're not returning them to the war zone, perhaps, but stay out of our country. But it can add up to the very, very much the same thing. So the international system is almost without a system right now. It's everybody on their own. It's very dangerous. We do have international agreements and commitments. We have the Geneva Con Convention, and we have responsibilities. And the United States, which has been a party to Middle Eastern wars and politics, and is part of this Syrian reality and this Syrian story, has a legal as well as moral obligation to take in more refugees. In 2016, Connecticut welcomed almost 1,000 refugees into our state, double the number settled in 2015. At least 100 of those refugees are from Syria. Can you tell us why your administration chose to receive more refugees and how the state supports them socially and financially? Well, uh, first let me just say I'm very happy to, to be uh, participating in this panel. Um, uh, the folks who were introduced after me have been much more on the front lines of this issue than, than I have. Um, I just wanted to make it very clear. Um, uh, after 30 governors had said they would close their states, uh, or 31, uh, to uh, uh, certain refugees, that, that Connecticut was not one of those states and that we would be welcoming. And in point of fact, between October 1, 2015 and September 2016, uh, we placed uh, over 819 refugees. Uh, 341 of those were from uh, Syria, 46 from Iraq, um, um, and other countries uh, obviously were a major part of that. And um, from October 1st, uh, 2016 through May of this year, uh, we've seen the placement of 379 refugees, 134 of those are from uh, Syria. Um, and. Uh, 
uh, others from Afghan and Iraq and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, I, I, um, I grew up in an America that was uh, chased uh, after its failures uh, leading up to the uh, uh, Second World War, um, um, uh, the unforgivable act of turning away uh, refugees who had uh, gotten themselves on a ship and clearly should have been welcomed uh, in our country and other countries. Um, and clearly, uh, our, uh, the time we spent ignoring uh, certain realities of what was happening in Europe leading up to uh, the Second World War should be sufficient warning for all of us that we uh, need to step forward um, uh, on an ongoing basis, not an occasional basis, uh, and stand for human rights. Uh, a portion of those rights uh, are to find a new country in which to, say, to, to live um, uh, peacefully and safely uh, when you're no longer uh, welcome uh, in your own country or cannot return to that country. Uh, and that certainly is well documented by uh, international agreements going back to 1951 out of disgust of uh, our inability to have placed refugees from Europe, um, um, uh, uh, European war, the Second World War. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to the good work of the UN, uh, international agreement was signed and we're partners uh, and signatories to that agreement. Uh, and I don't believe that any governor for that matter or any mayor or any individual has the right to refuse entry uh, to any um, uh, legal immigre, uh, and that includes refugees, who, by the way, are the most screened um, uh, visitors to our country, and that's what they are for one year, and then they're required to uh, apply for their green card status, and uh, most then apply for their citizenship uh, within uh, the next five years after that. Um, and uh, with respect to the specific uh, question, the reality is, is in year one at least, uh, most of the costs are reimbursed uh, or come to the United, come to the, 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 the uh, receiving state um, uh, and are then transferred to the agencies that, that supply uh, uh, the support. Uh, there are those occasions when the state will, uh, in the normal course, as we would with respect to any other visitor or citizen uh, of our country, uh, step in and uh, provide other services. Uh, but with respect to year one, um, uh, you know, most of that, that, that cost is, is, is really associated to the federal government, not to the state government. Uh, after a refugee receives a green card, uh, they're entitled to any other service that any other individual in the country uh, is entitled to who has a green card. Um, uh, and whether they're receiving support based on their economic circumstances or health challenges or not, um, uh, then, then is uh, shared uh, potentially with state government. But even in those programs, if we're, for instance, talking about a medical emergency that was reimbursable through Medicaid or Medicare if the person was a senior citizen, those are largely federally funded programs as well. The, 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 the supposed drain on state government just doesn't exist. Now, uh, there are other uh, uh, requirements. Obviously, uh, uh, our United States Constitution and our state constitution, Connecticut, are uh, state and are otherwise interpreted to mean that we have to provide an education to any child who lives in our country. If you, if you associate the cost to that, uh, that is a cost that, that society takes on. The reality is that most refugees are women and children, um, so there, there are costs associated. Um, but that's a fractional expense uh, in any municipality uh, in which those refugee children would be uh, positioned. Uh, particularly since most of them live, uh, not all, not exclusively, but, but many of them, I should probably say, uh, live in large uh, urban school districts. So we're talking about thousands of children being affected by um, um, a very small number of children uh, with respect to the, those expenses to the extent that that is, would be very difficult to, to break out. So those are honest answers to honest questions and by way of introduction. Thank you, Governor Malloy. I recently read on PBS that a city in New York, Utica, um, has seen educated refugees become a huge part of the, of the labor force, that it's actually halted the city's economic decline, um, contributing, they contribute economically, culturally, enrich our communities. Would you say, in your experience of what the refugees that Connecticut um, has um, brought in and welcomed into our state, that they've been uh, a net 
producers into our economy or uh, how much can you give us an idea as to what that cost is on the on the taxpayer well, I, I I think that um, the, much of the arguments, many of the arguments made uh, against accepting refugees, particularly from certain countries, are culturally or religiously based um, forms of discrimination. Um, but if you study the countries that we are talking about, we're talking about people coming from some of the hardest working uh, societies uh, in the world. Um, Chris spent time uh, with Palestinians and Palestinian refugees uh, over the course of his uh, professional life. Um, I, I, you'd be hard pressed to find people who work harder than Palestinians um, uh, under very difficult circumstances. So whether it's an immediate return or, 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 or an eventual return, um, I, I think immigrants and refugees have been a, a net plus. I, I can say that as someone whose people uh, emigrated from uh, Ireland beginning in, um, uh, well, my great grandfather was born in Ireland in 1843. Uh, came to the United States and fought two tours uh, uh, in the Civil War um, uh, for the uh, uh, for the Union, I might add. Um, uh, <laughs> we are in Connecticut. So, so, uh, uh, so you know, I, I, I think uh, we are a, a company, a, a country of refugees. I mean, I, I, and and people seeking a second chance. And I, I do. I, I spent a lot of time in criminal justice reform, and these are totally separate issues but they have some similarities. And I frequently talk about Second Chance Society, which is my efforts on the part of criminal justice reform, and, and point out that unless you, your people were brought here in slavery or you're a Native American, everyone else's people came here first for a second chance. Uh, and that's true of my people. Um, and uh, it certainly is true of our refugee population. Um, so uh, we're a better country because we had uh, rounds of refugees and rounds of people coming from other countries. And it really is quite remarkable um, how American culture um, uh, probably uh, is more inviting um, because it bends itself to a greater extent to be inviting. Great. Thank you, Governor Malloy. Becca, maybe you want to add to that, and then I want to come back to what IRAP does and, and sort of the vetting process that, that we yeah, go through. Yeah, I mean, as a Jew, like, my family's here on something like our 57th chance. Um, <laughs> so we're really grateful for, you know, America's place in the end of the refugee diaspora. Um, but, the, you know, I think all cultural assumptions aside, the, in terms of, like, refugees' ability to to contribute to communities, it's important to keep in mind that refugees, in addition to being extremely vetted, are, are self-selecting. Um, the, the definition of a refugee is someone who's been basically severely persecuted in their home country and who has gotten out. You're not a refugee, technically, until you cross an international border. Um, and having worked with thousands of refugees, let me tell you, it requires really, really hard work to go through the kinds of persecution that people go through and then navigate your way across a border through this like crazy bureaucratic system to get to the US. And it, you really have to be honestly like a, like a self-starter. Um, you have to be incredibly tenacious and work incredibly hard. So I, I think like regardless of what, what your country of origin is or what your nationality is, like the incredible self-selection process that it takes to even like navigate this whole geopolitical process in the first place really ensures that the, the people who actually make it here, you know, for lack of a better word, like have gumption. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting, um, you know, there's all these lawsuits going on right now that you guys may have heard about. Um, and a woman named Vivian Yi, who is a graduate of this university um, and just joined the immigration desk at the New York Times, went out to write a story about sort of who are the plaintiffs behind these lawsuits. And I think her angle on the story, um, which is what I think a lot of people are angling on about refugees and pop culture, which I don't love, is this sort of like refugees, they're just like us. Right, Th this idea that like we see refugees as the other, and the important thing is to humanize them and say, oh, refugees, they go to the gas station and they open bank accounts and they send their kids to school. Um, and I would actually posit that refugees are kind of better than us. Um, 
because they do all of that in spite of all the things that they've gone through and like how terribly difficult it is to relocate here. And she found something really fascinating, which was that when she went to talk to the different plaintiffs of the lawsuits, I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in litigation, um, but it's really awful. Uh, people are really mean. It goes on for years. Like it can, it can leave you very aggrieved, and you're sort of constantly thinking about your injury, right? So you would think that the the refugees participating in these Muslim ban lawsuits would be very fixated on like how discriminated they've been, um, the government has been to them, and how the U.S. feels to them. And what she found was that almost all of the people she talked to said that she was like, you know you know, tell me about why you're participating in this lawsuit. And they were like, oh my God, it's so amazing. I live in a country where you can sue the president. <laughs> um, and I just, I think you will like never find a group of more patriotic people than refugees because they know what a lack of democracy looks like. So I think the value add to our society of bringing these people in is just, it's economic, but it's also like, if you care at all about like the American tradition, which allegedly the Civil War was fought over, um, we'll keep bringing in refugees. And Becca, could you t walk us through the process? Because I think- No, because it makes no sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Wait, go don't ahead. Don't walk through. Yeah. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> because out there, people think there is no process, but in actual fact, it's, it's, it's a very, very rigorous process. Um, so when a refugee is identified, registered, and, and vetted for resettlement in America, walk us through how difficult it is for that refugee in Iraq or Syria or wherever, how difficult is it actually for them to come to our country? Um, it's so difficult that I gave up a six-figure salary offer to work at a public law firm because I felt that the process was so complicated that people needed full-time lawyers to assist them with with navigating it. Um, you, you know, it, the process usually takes three to five years and we don't have that long. Um, but the synopsis is, um, first you register with the United Nations. The UN is allegedly screening you to see if there's something really urgent about your case. Um, whether you need to be referred for medical assistance, whether um, you're gay or a survivor of trafficking, so you need to be referred for protection, or whether you should be referred for resettlement. Um, this immediately breaks down for two reasons. One is that the UN is just dramatically underfunded and that's about to get worse. So they don't actually have the resources to do outreach to most of the most vulnerable people. And two is that referrals are mutually exclusive. So if you have a protection need or a medical need, you can't simultaneously be referred for resettlement, which means that by definition, the most vulnerable people tend to not be getting referred for resettlement, which has very few slots available allegedly for the most vulnerable, um, which started out, um, funnily enough, because the UN didn't digitize their files. So there was literally only one folder per case, and they, the folder couldn't be in multiple units at the same time. Um, but you know, the governor talked about how we, we formed these legal agreements um, starting in 1951. It took the US until 1967 to join in, but we got there. Um, and, uh, and we really haven't updated the system since then. Um, if you get selected by the UN, which like one out of 30 people will be, um, to get referred to the US for a settlement, you'll then go through a minimum of three interviews. They'll be anywhere from one to seven hours long. You'll have to produce hundreds of pieces of paperwork. Uh, most of it m won't make sense. And then there's something that I think of as sort of the trauma credibility paradox. So the vast majority of refugees that get rejected coming to this country um, actually get rejected because the person interviewing them doesn't believe them. Uh, and that's because what happens is that like something really awful happens to you and then you flee your house in the middle of the night and if you're smart, you don't bring your documents, right? Because you don't wanna get stopped and checked and have someone find those documents, right? The same way that like when we go through JFK, we have to delete all of our social media accounts so they don't see like what we're actually saying about customs and border protection on them. <laughs> so, so most refugees have no real physical evidence of what happened to them, which means that the only thing that they have to rely upon in these interviews is the veracity of their own word. And of course, if something really traumatizing happens to you, you're probably going to have some kind of post-traumatic stress. And the primary way that that's likely to manifest is in an inability to recall or discuss the precipitating event, which is the entire focus of the interview. So, in this whole interview, they're looking for you to sort of become, it, it's really victimizing in a way, because I think that refugees are these people who have been through this crazy stuff and have survived. Um, and then we're trying to like shoehorn them and say, like we've had people rejected because they didn't cry when they talked about something really upsetting at their interview. So the person thought they were lying because they were having an inappropriate emotional reaction. 
Um, then simultaneously with all of this, uh, you're being background checked by something like 20 different intelligence agencies, like eight of which you know we can't name because we'd have to kill you, against like numerous databases, and you go through every database twice. Um, and then that's only good for 12 months. So if the process takes longer than 12 months, you go through the whole thing again. Uh, then you get re-vetted a little bit by the Office of Refugee Resettlement for the US, and then finally you get to get on a plane when you have a TSA check, and then a check by Customs and Border Protection. And so essentially, and I know you've made this point, I've heard you make it before, that even though Muslim Ban, Muslim ban 1.0 and Muslim Ban 2.0, that they were um, rejected by the courts, that essentially a Muslim Ban 3.0 is actually going on right now, and, and the vetting process is actually harder than it was uh, before this new president took office and, and has kind of put that notion out there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of really interesting statistics have come out about the number of not just refugee, but also like disproportionate visa rejections of people from predominantly Muslim countries. Uh, and I expect that to get worse before it gets better. Thank you. Justin, NIL NILC is one of the leading organizations in the U.S. exclusively dedicated to defending and advancing the rights of low-income immigrants and refugees. Can you walk us through the work that your organization has done since the elections and how proposed federal policy or the Muslim ban will affect a state like Connecticut? We'll be doing a deeper dive into the Supreme Court decision later, but if you could kind of give us an overview and historical perspective on that, would be great. Sure. Um, and. Backing up slightly from, uh, well, first, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for being here. I, I appreciate everyone who's here and wants to learn about this topic. It's great uh, that there's so much interest. Um, so backing up slightly from the election, let's say from the campaign, I, I was glad that the Paris attacks in November of 2015 were mentioned because that's really where all of this started. Um, you know, I've been doing immigrants' rights work since I was in law school, graduated from law school here in 2008. Uh, and, you know, I... In, in all the work of uh, all the immigrants' rights work that I that I did up until November of 2015, I never worked with refugees ever. And most of us in the immigrants' rights world who do like sort of civil rights for for immigrants, uh, most of us didn't either. Because why would anyone pick on refugees? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense, right? Like uh, they, you know, we always have to fight this dichotomy of like good refugee, uh, excuse me, good immigrants versus va bad immigrants. Like that's like a common frame that uh, is used, unfortunately, in in our political discourse. Um, but no one ever doubted that refugees were the good immigrants, and so um, and so they just weren't targets of the kind of discrimination that we've seen in the last couple of years until the Paris attacks and until Donald Trump, frankly. Uh, and you know, if you look back at the uh, at uh, his uh, Twitter account, as I have uh, had to do much more than I would like uh, recently, um, you can see in his public comments and everything else, I mean, he, Donald Trump was talking about uh, Syrian refugees from the summer of 2015, but it was really the Paris attacks uh, that sort of galvanized that as a part of his campaign and his call for, you know, a total and complete shutdown of Muslim immigration to the United States that occurred like two weeks after the Paris attacks. It's not a coincidence. Uh, and so... When these 31 governors started, um, you know, saying that they were going to turn away Syrian refugees, we, of course, uh, started suing. And, um, you know, we'd been suing states for discriminating against undocumented folks for years. Um, and I have to say that when they started discriminating against Syrian refugees, it's like the easiest lawsuits that we've ever had to put together. I mean, it's just crystal clear. You don't even have to explain why you like that, you know, just because they're undocumented doesn't mean they don't have rights. No, none of that. It was like, they're, you know, they're lawfully present. They're refugees. What are you doing? This is, you're discriminating against them on the basis of national origin and their immigration status, both of which states are not allowed to do. Um, and, uh, you know, the lawsuits are relatively easy um, on the merits, legally. Uh, sometimes getting them off the ground was a little difficult because, you know, I remember, so I live in Atlanta and, you know, the Georgia governor was one of the first to, uh, to do this. And I went and met with a Syrian refugee family, um, you know, to talk to them about all of this. And, you know, we were talking about filing a lawsuit. And, and the question I got was, won't the governor, like, send his men to beat us up? And, um, and I never actually had that question from a client before. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, but that was, you know, that's where they're coming from. That's the sort of, uh, uh, that was the first question that they had. And, 
At any rate, uh, you know, thankfully, the courts shut down the state's attempt to discriminate against Syrian refugees relatively quickly. Texas, Alabama, Indiana, none of them were able to get away with it um, at all. But then, of course, we had the election and uh, and Donald Trump immediately continued what the states had already started, tried to start. And so um, so since then, you know, I don't want won't get into a deep dive into the to litigation yet, but um you know, as soon as the election happened and we got over our shock, uh, we immediately started thinking like, okay, what's this Muslim ban going to look like? Um, you know, that's been promised. Um, so what's it going to look like? And we thought it was going to look actually a lot like uh, a program called NSEERS, which was a registration program that was instituted after 9-11 that, um, you know, prevented no terrorist attacks, caught no terrorists, but did, um, you know, sweep up a lot of, of Muslim immigrants. Um, who were out of status or, or, or the like. Uh, and so we sort of anticipated it being something like that. Um, and then, of course, uh, after the inauguration, that first week, various uh, versions of what became the Muslim ban were, were leaked, and we started gearing up. Um, and, you know, we were going to, to sue to challenge it when everything blew up in the airports, and we got sidetracked a little bit on that kind of litigation with, with IRAP. Um, but the the long and short of it is the you know the first the first Muslim ban we you know we were involved in the the airport litigation along with IRAP or co-counseling with them and the ACLU and the the law schools uh, worker and immigrants rights advocacy clinic um, and then we filed the second case which is now up at the Supreme Court um, it's Trump v IRAP now um, and I, and I can talk about that a little more later. Great, thank you. I'm going to jump over to Chris George because I want to finish sort of the resettlement process and then we're going to go to you, Professor Mubarak, so we can talk about the economic impact. Um, Chris, your organization, IRIS, is contracted by the State Department to work with local groups to resettle and integrate refugee families into our communities. What are you doing to make sure that refugees successfully integrate and how much money both state and federal is spent on resettlement? Sure. So a little more on the structure. Um, Many of you might already know this, but um, there are 350 uh, refugee resettlement, I'm going to call them entities, uh, refugee resettlement age. I call them entities because... No, because of the Supreme Court decision. Yes. That's brilliant. We We're all entities now. <laughs> yes. We used to call them refugee resettlement agencies. IRIS now is called an entity. We're all entities. We're, we're all entities. Um, You're all entities. <laughs> there are 300, 350 refugee resettlement agencies slash entities spread across the country, 350. They're all connected to at least one of nine national organizations. You're, you've heard of many of them, the International Rescue Committee, Catholic Charities, Church World Service. And those nine are all under the supervision regulation of the State Department, which handles, along with the Department of Homeland Security, the overseas selection and the vetting process. So it's a public-private partnership, probably the most efficient public-private partnership in the country. Uh, the government does the selection, provides regulations and standards, does some oversight, provides some funding, but the hard work of actually welcoming and resettling refugees is done by nonprofit groups, voluntary organizations. Refugees are resettled in virtually every state in the country. There are three refugee resettlement agencies in Connecticut. Um, uh, one is in Hartford, Catholic Charities. One is in Bridgeport International Institute, and we're based here in, in New Haven. And our job is to welcome refugees and help them get off to a good start. The overall objective is to help refugees become self-sufficient. It is a struggle and it's supposed to be a struggle. The blueprint for today's refugee resettlement program is the American immigrant experience. You've heard some of your parents or grandparents talk about <coughs> it. We all crammed into one bedroom. We had to walk miles to get a job. The first job was, you know, washing dishes in the snow. You know, it was tough. Um, and we had no money. We came with nothing. Um, I was, you know, a very successful businessman overseas in my home country, but here I started at the bottom of the ladder. That is what most refugees go through. We have very little money. We get some money from the federal government. Our budget's roughly $2 million. Um, 
roughly half of that is from the federal government. The other half we have to raise privately. No money from the state. We get actually something better than money from our state government. <laughs> we get a governor who welcomes with open arms refugees from all over the world. Uh, and that's worth millions. We get a community like New Haven and the rest of Connecticut, which has stepped forward even when refugee resettlement became controversial, even when others were turning away, even when our own president was saying he wants to send Syrian refugees home and not accept any new refugees who are Muslim. The more controversial and negative stuff that was said nationally, people in Connecticut stepped forward and said, we want to help. You know, how can we help? Train us to resettle refugees and we'll welcome a Syrian refugee into our neighborhood. A group of five synagogues in the greater New Haven area came together almost immediately and said, we want to welcome Syrian Muslim refugees into our neighborhoods. Show us how. So we had no choice but to ask Washington to double the number of refugees. We had more offers of help than we had refugees to accept it. <laughs> it's kind of a weird situation to be in, and we're almost facing that now. If the numbers begin to dwindle, we've got at least a dozen community groups that are hoping to resettle refugees, and if we don't get more assigned to us, they'll be left waiting. So that's the structure. What does it cost? Well, the total number from beginning to end for the government is probably about, I mean, journalists did some research a couple of years ago. It comes to about $17,000 per refugee. All of the government costs to send people overseas, to do the vetting process, to pay them danger pay, you know, to buy the computers, to bring them here, to get them started with the State Department welcome grant, about $17,000 per person to save their lives. That's why we do it, after all. I mean, sure, they're an economic benefit. Sure, they're great soccer players. Sure, they're amazing dressmakers and incredible cooks, and they enrich our communities and diversify us. But in the end, we welcome refugees to save their lives. And that should be enough. So the costs are I think minimal. I mean, we spend probably a total of about $4,000 per person uh, to resettle the refugees that we resettle here in, in Iris. And we get so much help from volunteers and, and community groups. Uh, it is phenomenal. I just have to show a map, all right? So usually, my first 10 years on the job, about two groups per year would step forward and say, hey, Iris, we want to welcome refugees. Show us how to do it. We want to be a community co-sponsor. Two groups a year. Since January of 2016, look at all the dots on the map. These are all community groups all over the state that want to welcome refugees. 50 refugee families have been placed with community groups so far in Connecticut. This should be happening all over the country. We need to convince those 350 entities, refugee resettlement agencies, that they can also do a program like this. And if we're successful, we'll be able to dramatically increase the number of refugees coming to this country. And not only that, behind every dot are hundreds of volunteers who are learning about the global refugee crisis, understanding the refugee resettlement process, getting a clear picture of what vetting means, meeting real live refugees, tutoring kids in school, walking them to the grocery store, helping them learn English, helping them understand their electricity bill. That is how you build support for refugee resettlement. If this were happening in every state, there'd be so much pushback against what's going on in Washington, there'd be no need for a conference like this. No offense. Thank you, Chris. And um, so, you know, what you've highlighted is that at a, at a minimal cost, helping refugees is the right thing to do. 
I'm going to move on to Professor Mubarak now, and who will help us. Uh, highlight that it's actually the smart thing to do as well. And I just want to first uh, tell you about a recent study of refugees living in Cleveland, Ohio, that I read about. Um, and in that area, they found, found that the fiscal impact of refugees was an estimated $2.7 million in tax revenue and a total economic benefit of $48 million in 2012 alone. And between 2002 and 2012, refugees served, started 38 businesses that employed 141 locals in the Cleveland area. So, so that's where, in this little town, we found that it's also a smart thing to do. And I imagine that's kind of the case all, all the way around. I'm going to first play a very quick video. I know we're pressed on time, but a very quick video that Professor Babarak has put together. Uh, and then he's going to talk about his research behind this. I'm Mushfiq Mubarak, and I'm a professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. I want to tell you about the logic behind the economic benefits of migration and outline six ideas that come out of the empirical research on this subject. Each of these points is backed up by rigorous studies. Here's how a lot of people think about immigration. A migrant worker comes in and takes a job away from a native worker. There are a lot of mistakes in this picture, according to the economists who have studied migration. First, the story would be that simple only if an immigrant substitutes for a native worker perfectly. In reality, migrants often take jobs natives don't want. And immigrants are more likely to move into sectors where language skills and customer or client-facing skills are not as important. In other words, natives with such skills are not easily displaced. In the case of agriculture, for instance, migrant workers literally keep fruits from rotting on the ground. In some cases, migrant labor can even be a complement to natives. That's an economist's way of saying that migration can create more jobs than existed before. Picture a busy restaurant. Orders flying into the kitchen, dishes flying out to diners, and then back to the sink. Now imagine migrant labor makes it easier for the business owner to find cheap dishwashers business does better, it expands and brings in more waiters and managers. Or think about this, there are 168 hours in each week and you have a certain number of things that you just have to get done. You have to work, care for your children, mow the lawn, maintain your car and home. What would you do if someone took one of those chores off your hands? Okay, you might just play more PlayStation, but not everyone is like that. Many migrants provide services like lawn mowing and babysitting, lowering those costs and freeing time for workers to be more productive. Here's another important point. Innovation makes our economy grow. Highly skilled migrants create scientific breakthroughs and other improvements. Foreign-born scientists and engineers resident in the US create many of these innovations. The typical Nobel Prize winner is affiliated with a US university, but was not born in the United States. These innovations result in new products and markets. Most new jobs are created by new and growing businesses. So who creates the businesses that create these jobs? Here are just a few of the companies that were founded by immigrants to the US. You might have heard of some of them. This fact isn't so surprising if you think about who immigrants are. Who leaves their home to strike out for a distant land? Someone with ambition and gumption. And who can successfully navigate all the challenges of such a move? Someone with intelligence and grit. Again, the economists have a term for this. It's called selectivity. While immigration will certainly create challenges for some individuals, the research is clear that overall it drives economic growth and creates more winners and losers in the receiving countries. that video to my eight and seven year old and they loved it as well. So it's, it's a video for everyone. Um, so <coughs> Professor Mubarak, if you can expand on, on that video, what, what your research is showing and, and the focusing on the economic impact. Uh, sure. Um, so I'll try my best to just talk about um, topics and ideas and results that are based on rigorous studies with large sample data as opposed to relying on anecdotes. However, before I get into that, though, I do want to 
well, thank you for organizing and um, for moderating. Uh, thank all the panelists for being here. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us, for, for many of my students who are here. And I want to thank uh, Governor Malloy for uh, taking a very brave stance. Uh, as a former I immigrant myself, or from not a very long time ago, I'm uh, a pre deeply appreciative of the stance you've taken and all the work, all the fantastic work that the other panelists are doing. Um, I, I immigrated here from a very poor country, Bangladesh. My wife immigrated from a very poor family. She's from the Cayman Islands. And uh, I remember, this is the anecdote part. This is not large sample data. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I just uh, recently, just last week, had a conversation in DC with a friend from graduate school. So we had gotten married when we were undergrads. We arrived at graduate school. To, I was getting a PhD, and she was getting a master's degree. And, um, and a friend wanted to bo borrow $100. And then I realized I literally didn't have that. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't have the same set of challenges that refugees have had to go through. I'm not trying to equate that uh, situation, right? But, uh, you know, Im immigrants who come to this country uh, are, uh, as, you, as you were saying, Becca, very positively selected. No, right? I think we, we pre-organized this with the gumption Gump adjective. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's an unusual <laughs> word to use and for it to come up thrice now. I'm know. a huge fan. I've been watching this video on repeat uh, for oh, days okay, in preparation okay. for this. <laughs> okay. um, and then, you know, so now, you know, it's been uh, 15, 20 years since. Now, you know, we're providing sort of uh, thanks to this great country, this great state, we're providing maybe a can thousand. I, can I borrow $100? <laughs> As it turns out, now I, I don't have the excuse. As you're a lawyer, I'm going to advise you. He only has credit cards. Uh, so It'll balance the budget. <laughs> you're only off by $100? <laughs> You know, so my children have a thousand times the opportunity, and hopefully they'll go on, they'll go on to do greater things than, than, than we did. Uh, so, for example, my daughter, at, I guess two years ago at the time she was 10, she organized this huge drive and um, talked to Iris. And from her school and friends, they, they, you know, Iris had some needs for alarm clocks and blankets, et cetera, like some of your staff mentioned. And, and for the last year or year and, or year and a half, there's been boxes and boxes of alarm clocks and blankets and other materials sitting in my, uh, sitting in my garage. And uh, she was a little frustrated saying that I did all this work, but they don't want it. And then I was like, that's a great problem to have. So because, you know, who the I says, Who says we don't want <laughs> it? No, I Iris' response was, look, we ha already have enough because people have been so generous. <laughs> you totally right? just got someone and fired. We need, <laughs> we need more refugees for these alarm clocks <laughs> exactly. and blankets. So, I mean, that's, uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, what a great state, what a great organization that we've been able to mobilize that many resources that we're actually in excess now. Uh, we're, we're very lucky to be living here. Okay, so now going to the, uh, uh, the hard data. So all of the points I made in that video were, um, were only based on studies that have very rigorous large sample data with very good research techniques behind them. Okay? And so let me tell you what the economics research shows when you aggregate across sort of the five, 600, or 700 studies that have been done on the economic effects of immigration. So it's an important enough topic and a policy issue that every 10 years or so, the National Academy of Sciences has convened a panel uh, to look at, okay, what do we know about this topic, about this policy topic? Is immigra immigration good or bad for the country? What are the costs? What are the benefits? Right? And here's the sort of four bullet point summaries. Right? So one, um, Im immigrants don't seem to put much of a downward pressure on native wages. That was the point I was making in the video, right? Except if they do, it seems to be concentrated on previous generations of immigrants, right? Because a new generation of immigrants is the closest substitute for somebody who came before. But it's not as easy for them to displace Americans who may have local language skills, you know, culture-specific skills. It's not as easy for them to displace them, right? So, so if you're worried about, uh, you know, previous generations of people, you should worry about people like, like me Oh, and, and we're the ones who are trying to like, close the door behind us. <laughs> um, and then on economic growth, the, the results are unequivocal that uh, areas, so for example, states that have seen higher uh, rates of in-migration uh, has higher rates of economic growth. Okay? Then on entrepreneurship, on employment creation, especially among high-skilled immigrants, the effects are even stronger and much more positive and not really subject to any academic debate. Right? Uh, Im uh, immigrants create a disproportionate share of businesses in, in the country there. So for example, about 15% of the labor force are not native born, they're foreign born. 
but about 20%, 25% of entrepreneurs are. Right? So they're much more, disproportionately more likely to be job creators. Right? And finally, in terms of fiscal costs, um, so the, res the, the results do show that in the first couple of years, immigrants take more out of the system than they put in, but if you take a 10 to 15 year view, that reverses. Right? Immigrants are, uh, like revenues exceed, exceed the cost that they impose. Right? And of course, the National Academy of Sciences put together this panel, and I want to talk about communication of this research. Right? And this panel like, wrote a very clear and nice executive summary with these four points that I just highlighted. Right? And then the right-wing media covered it by saying like, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences expert panel says that immigration imposes a $500 billion fiscal cost on the U.S. economy. That was their read of that, uh, <laughs> of, of that report. Right? Uh, and that's not how the Washington Post and New York Times covered it. They actually uh, they were much more responsible in that they just wrote down what was in the executive summary without further interpretation or, or, or picking and choosing. Uh, so I think it's important for us to think about not just you know, what the research shows, but how do we effectively communicate it and, and, and how policy is made, right? Because there's a lot of things that get uh, screwed up in the middle, right? And uh, finally, let me take the complementary position that Chris took, right? Which is imagine that we don't care at all about the humanitarian motives here. Right? We don't care about saving lives. Right? So is it a good idea for us uh, to allow refugees and immigrants to come in? Okay. Uh, I think on the economic side, the answer is for sure yes. Okay? That's what the data show. Okay? So even if you don't care, it actually is a pretty good idea. Okay? Now, what are the, uh, but we also, you know, we, I don't want this to be an echo chamber, and we also have to be aware of and worried about, um, uh, you know, some downside risks. Right? So what are they? And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm Muslim, and so this is a, uh, this is, you know, the security risk and, you know, how my community is perceived is something I think about and worry about. But, of course, I have this um, um, a professional handicap that a anytime I'm even thinking about, like, what, what is it that my family is about, like, I always just go to the data and think about, like, what the data says, right? <laughs> okay. That's a uh, it's, it's hard for me to think without looking at data, right? <laughs> And so if you look at, uh, so th there's a, uh, a lot of people who are worried about immigrants coming in, they worry about like, responses that Muslims uh, have to attitudinal surveys that are done around the world, right? So, so attitudinal surveys are things like, you know, we are asking large samples of people around the world, what do you think about people of a different religion? What do you think about women's place in society, right? And what, what sh how, how they should behave in, at home, what their responsibilities should be? What do you think about homosexuality, right? And uh, people have pointed out that, look, Muslims may, uh, or people from Muslim majority countries or Muslims themselves, because there are also religion indicators in these, um, uh, in these surveys, that they express opinions that are just not conducive to our culture, right? that don't fit with our culture. Right? And OK, so then when when people have made this point, and if you go on YouTube, you'll see lots of videos where people are reporting these data, right? So then my, the question for me was, oh, is, it, is that really about religion, or is it about poverty or the place that people are coming from? So for example, is it the case that Christians in Nigeria express opinions that are a lot better than Muslims in Nigeria, right? Or is it the case that you know, Pakistanis are expressing opinions that are a lot worse than Indians, right? So think about, like, you know, we should think about a control group here. That's, that's the only case that I'm making, right? That you know, it's, even, if you, even if you're making the case that Muslims are expressing bad opinions, right? we ought to be thinking about, are they expressing bad opinions relative to people who have similar socioeconomic characteristics or something else that might be driving it? So is it religion? Is it, econ is it economics? Is it education? Right? It, it, what, what happens if you control for education? So it turns out these gaps you know, that people highlight, that uh, you know, Muslims express opinions about homosexuals, about women, right? that we would find troublesome. And if you you know, if you read the responses, you would find, I think you would find it troublesome, okay? Now, once you start controlling for these other factors, so is it, you know, so I can ask the question, how are Nigerians responding to these questions when they're Christian versus Muslim? So I'm holding constant the country they come from, right? And I'm holding constant some income level and education level. And it turns out those gaps become narrower, but they do remain, okay? And so Jewish people express opinions that I would say, you know, liberals would find most comforting, right? But both Christians and Muslims, in relative to that, express opinions that I think you would find troublesome. Right? And so we can't just wash that away. Right? 
And this is something that we, our community needs to tackle, right? I also think about, you know, uh, people who are, my, my kids are growing up in a Muslim community with lots of Bangladeshi uh, friends. Um, and, you know, and I'm looking closely at, okay, how are, what are, parent, what are parents teaching their kids, okay? And I think all, you know, it's not like, just like uh, America is not necessarily an exceptional place. It just happens to have been able to attract exceptional people. It's not like Nigerians or Bangladeshis or Indians that they, that just because they're refugees, that they're exceptional people. They're just human beings. There's going to be a distribution of people, good and bad, right? And there's, they're going to pose some risks, right? And I, and I do agree with Chris that in spite of those risks, I think the right thing to do is to be welcoming right, and to save lives. But we also have to be aware of and figure out how to enact policies to tackle those types of risks, right? So that uh, cultural assimilation happens and we don't end up with more problems. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mubarak. Bushra, very excited to hear about your story. If you could walk us through when you were uh, first vetted, um, how long it took, um, your journey to Connecticut, and, and then your journey to learn the language, assimilate, and, and start your own business. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for I'm being so here. I'm so glad I meet all the people. Um, when I came here to 2014, I didn't speak English. I didn't know anyone. But after four months, I'm looking, I ask my daughter, please can help me for any address near us or like um, company for sewing or designer or because I have experience in Iraq 2000, uh, two, um, 20s, 25 years for sewing. I want to like learn something for sewing for like that. She uh, give me address. I'm go, uh, I want to the owner for uh, the studio, I tell him, hi, my name is Bushra, I want, I'm looking for a job. I don't speak English, but I'm trying. <laughs> uh, he told me, okay, uh, can you come uh, Monday? I want Monday, and he saw my work. He gave me internship. I'm very happy about that. After that, he gave me um, full job, um, full job. And I'm um, start job. I'm very happy because I want to learn the word in English for sewing, like zipper, <laughs> button. I know everything in Arabic, oh, so <laughs> but English I, heard I don't sewing. know. Sewing, sewing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes. I don't care Years about of lawyers. You know, I know. I can't hold. I don't them. care about money because I want to know. Uh, I want to know the word in English for my job. Mm -hmm. I start to work with them, with him, and uh, after that, I got uh, I got the second job with Davis Sobridal because I want to make my language is strong. After that, uh, after work one year and a half, I think uh, I start to think about my own business. I uh, told Iris about that. Please can help me because I want to open my own business. Iris helped me for. Uh, put my credit, uh, my business card in the office, and also give me machine, uh, stitch machine, and I start by about uh, uh, table, and uh, iron, steam iron, and after two years arrive here, I start open my own business called Bushra Fashion. And uh, do you employ people in your business? Are there other workers? Yes. 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 Great. Oh, yes. Did you make your dress? Yeah. No. This is a gift my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But sure. Okay. Can... Now I have customer. I can I speak English? Yeah. Thank Good. That. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about your life in Iraq uh, when you were forced to leave Iraq and and how long it took you? to come to the United States, what, the, what, what sort of the process was yes. uh, for you to be here? In Iraq, I have uh, my own dressmaking business. My husband, uh, he was accountant 27 years in Iraq. Uh, my children in, uh, were in school. Uh, when my son, oldest son, he get a job with, um, 
USA military contractor. Um, somebody don't like that. Uh, every time, ask me, uh, ask us why uh, we accept our son work with the American people. I don't care about that the first time because my son, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't doing anything wrong, only his work. After that, my guy, um, and then my husband got shot. This is the reason because mm -hmm. my son work. Um, this is mean I should leave Iraq. Um, we decided leave Iraq, go to Jordan. Live in Jordan one year and a half. But you ask me about the beating process. Beating my, our beating process start in Iraq because my son, when he applied for uh, work with the uh, USA military contractor, uh, he waited like 11 months before he worked with them. I remember he gave me like this paper, <laughs> more paper, information um, for me, for my husband, for my family, for sister, brother, all, all. My dad, uh, my grandpa, my grandma, like need all information uh, and need information for my friend five years before like that. And when I uh, moved to Jordan, the start, same. Same the question, same information. Ask about my family, my husband's family, for my uh, friend, what's, what did you work in Iraq? Uh, they give me the address they, for, for more, more information for all my family. And I'm stay like one year and a half. After that, I got a call from um, to uh, date for travel. I came here to uh, for nine April 2014. Mm. Great. I was happy. Welcome. Me and my family saved. Thank God. Great. Well, thank you everyone for for the fantastic input and shedding light on our um, on this issue. I'd like to now take the questions uh, to our audience and. Um, Governor Malloy, I'm going to start with you and take a couple of questions. I know um, that, that you're a little bit on a time crunch. Um, Governor Malloy, what's the risk federal government could force Connecticut to stop accepting refugees? I, I, don't, think there's any, uh, I don't think there's any legal basis uh, for uh, the federal government to do that. Um, uh, they're, they're, we're not violating any law. We're not... Uh, um, I, I suppose if, 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 if the Congress was to enact a law that gave that power to the executive branch to enforce uh, and it withstood uh, a challenge, uh, you know, then things could change. But I, I, I just, I, you know, just because we have a bluster in chief doesn't mean that um, uh, our Constitution is, uh, uh, you know, going to be violated uh, in, in, that, in that way. And, and do you have any thought on the recent Supreme Court uh, decision for the, um, well, they've decided to wait until the fall to really hear the entire case, but that uh, they are not letting refugees in. And you talked a little bit about Speca, or you will talk about this, but do you have any thought about how we can protect Connecticut from that particular vetting process where certain folks who are not tied to individuals, and I'm not sure how tied, what tied means exactly, that they're not being allowed to come through our borders. Well, you know, I, I think this is a, a, an area where Connecticut has demonstrated leadership, and educational institutions in Connecticut have demonstrated leadership. Uh, colleges and universities have gone out of their way uh, to be open uh, uh, to students uh, from across um, uh, uh, the world, and and I think have made a special effort uh, to make sure that uh, potential students from the countries that that the president had. Uh, identified uh, are, are reached out to and otherwise feel welcome. Um, and I, I do believe that a contact with the university um, may, uh, may ultimately be the, a, uh, meet the description um, uh, that was in this very short language that was used by the, uh, uh, the court. I think this refugee issue as an entity, uh, these, these uh, organizations. Uh, so I, I, I think that there's room 
um, uh, in uh, the rather short uh, uh, decision or announcement of the court. On the other hand, we can't ignore that three justices have said that they would enforce um, uh, uh, the law in its entirety without any um, limitation. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a scary thought. So they're already at three. Um, uh, they need to get to five. Um, is that hard or not? Um, uh, do, do the right justices live long enough uh, for this case to be decided uh, when it's heard after it's heard in October? Um, I, I, so I, I, you know, I think it's up in the air, I, but I do see a positive in, in that this concept that people who have relationships uh, or relatives or contact with, with a country uh, should not be denied uh, access. I, I think that's the one bright spot in the decision. And if that's, if that's open um, on a, a question for all of the remaining uh, members of the court, as opposed to these three who went out of their way to, to, to express themselves, um, then there's reason for hope. But, you know, uh, we've been disappointed in elections. We've been disappointed in court cases. We, you know, we live a life of, uh, uh, of some gains and some setbacks. And uh, another question for you, Governor Malloy. Tell us about how Connecticut State partners with nonprofits, I know, I think Christy spoke a little bit about this, uh, to settle with refugees economically and, and legally speaking. Well, I mean, I think, you know, our, our role is one of, uh, I, I, at least I envision it as one of leadership um, uh, and communication. Uh, you know, when, when I when I took the step that we took, we uh, made a point of communicating to our municipalities and to our uh, uh, boards of education. We have communicated with boards of education on an ongoing basis with respect uh, to their uh, responsibility. I can tell you that I've, I, ha I have not personally been contacted by any board of education official uh, in, in any local community who said that they don't want to honor um, um, uh, the work that others are doing and, and their legal obligations. So I, I think we play a leadership role. Um, we have uh, had discussions with, with the three agencies uh, in the state about ways that we can play a, a role. Some of that is financial, not directly to the agencies, but directly to the, the, the person in some cases providing a service or receiving a service. Um, but, but by and large, uh, Chris and his colleagues uh, uh, take the brunt of, of that work. Uh, but but I, there is a cost, uh, you know, and, and um, whether it's 17,000 on average or more in a more expensive place, I, I, I can't, you know, I, I don't have the data on it. There is a cost, but there's a gain. Um, and, um, you know, there's precious few uh, in this audience who can't trace their roots to some other country. Can uh, I ask a quick question that I actually don't know the answer to? Uh, I know that um, when refugees get assigned to resettlement agencies, you get like a few weeks notice typically. Mm -hmm. Does, but the number by state, does that get decided at the beginning of the fiscal year? Yeah, the, there's a state refugee coordinator uh -huh. based in the Department of Social Services who has to approve the numbers that the three refugee resettlement agencies give him at the start of the year. And does the state consider itself an entity? Yeah. <laughs> sure we do. Sure we are an entity. Can I, 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 well, I can, I can say definitively we are an entity. So, uh, um, in your official capacity. In, in my official capacity. Becky, well, you need to explain uh, to people in the audience who aren't uh, aware why we keep using the E word. You started it. I kind of feel like you should have to explain. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling has said that um, refugees will be allowed to enter the United States if they can demonstrate they have a bona fide relationship with an individual or an entity in this country. And lawyers are burning the midnight oil um, trying to figure out what entity means. I hear tomorrow we might get a ruling from the government. Um, we feel that refugees have relationships with us uh, long before they actually arrive. So we feel that, that we should be considered an entity and therefore um, 110,000 refugees should come this fiscal year. So what, what I'm playing with is that hypothetically, some, some like if Connecticut took a thousand, if you want to take a thousand refugees next year 
and you do those negotiations before the federal fiscal year starts, mm -hmm. then ostensibly there's a thousand refugees that have a relationship with Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I think you're, you're, you've gone a step too far. If, <laughs> That's if, usually true. Yeah, it's, it's a good try. Um, no, I, I think, I think it, it, that, that would only be true to the extent that an actual file um, has been opened uh, and, a, and a relationship established. So you can't establish a relationship with a number. You can establish a relationship with an individual. And I would agree that if, if that, that relationship is established between an agency and an individual, um, there's no doubt that, in my mind, that the agency is an entity. So humor me for just 30 more seconds. Let's say that there's an NGO. I'm a lawyer, too. I, 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 okay. I'm enjoying this. Right. If you're not, right. no, 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 no. <laughs> Let's say that there's an NGO that identified 600 refugees at the beginning of the fiscal year and sent files on them to Connecticut, and then and then the resettlement agency could request those 600 files, right, at these weird NFL draft refugee meetings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then, hypothetically, it's not just a number anymore; it's like an actual person. Yeah, I, I, I think that that, that is, at, le at the very least, the initial step of establishing uh, um, an actual uh, relationship. I think uh, then the courts would say, well, has there been communication of that relationship? How do you have a relationship to, with, with someone that you haven't had a communication with? So, I mean, I think there are other logical steps, but I think the, the premise that you're driving is that if those relationships can be uh, constituted uh, uh, identified, constituted, uh, and action taken, then, then there's reason to believe that under any reasonable uh, interpretation of what an entity is or relationship is, that that person would be safe. Uh, I also think that's true of somebody who's received treatment at, uh, at a hospital uh, or someone who's being educated at an institution. Um, um, you, now you should ask, well, does that mean you have a relationship if, 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 that, if the education is taking place over the internet? Well, that, well, that, that, that would be a, an interesting question, but, but I think that those are, those are very real questions and ones that I, the, 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 the one reason I take some level of hope is that only three justices said that they would um, enforce the law uh, as written um, and uh, the rest of at least uh, are open to some redefinition. And so one of the questions uh, from our audience was, will refugee organizations count as the bona fide <laughs> connection to the United States? And what I'm hearing is, no, it wouldn't, or we are still yet to? Oh, that's a, oh, it's a resounding yes. Yes. We are entities, yes. So, okay, uh, right. With so relationships. In, with relationships. With relationships, so, yes. So we, we got Bushra's file, biographical information about her and her entire family months before right. she came here. And I think we'll argue that at that point, at least, we've got a relation, you have a relationship with an entity. Right. Right. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, question for Becca or anybody else who wants to answer this. How are refugees and immigrants placed in jobs? How well are they matched with work that they have experience with or work that they consider to be fulfilling? And, and Professor Mubarak, you may want to add to this. Becca, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's start. a question for that okay. side of the panel. And Chris, you may want to. How are refugees placed in jobs? Right, and how are they matched up with the, the uh, talent that they may come to our state with? How the job, their first job in particular, right. matches up with the talent Right, what's the process bring. of actually finding the job? Uh, well, I've got at least one staff member in the audience who, Danny, who works with refugees and helping them uh, learn English and find jobs, and the two are intertwined very closely. Um, the biggest obstacle that refugees have to getting work, any kind of work, especially work that's at the level of what they were used to doing in their home country, is language. They don't speak English. We have welcomed physics professors from the University of Baghdad who had very good lives in Baghdad, but they didn't speak a word of English. Their only job opportunities initially we're cleaning hotel rooms, working in the back of restaurants, maybe working in small factories. It is a shock to people like that. Um, but with, under Danny's instruction, they learn English quickly, and, and some can you know, hopefully get something that's a little, little higher. 
But that's the immigrant experience. Yeah, and um, every now and then we'll get someone who is very accomplished in their home country and does have some English, and uh, they will move into jobs much closer. Yes. I mean, Busher is an example of someone like. who has been able to do, because, because her job has not required a high level of English fluency, she was able to jump into something fairly soon after you arrived that's similar to what you were doing in, in Iraq. And my husband, he has uh, experience for... Um, uh, Auto mechanic? No, uh, Muhasib. Accountant. Accountant. 27 years in Iraq. Uh -huh. But here, when, because he didn't speak English, he started to uh, work a mechanic. This is okay. It's okay. No and problem. he's an excellent mechanic. Yes. He, he fixed my Jeep. He did a better job on my Jeep than, you know, than an yes. auto mechanic uh, yes. who's worked here 40 years. But and and Busha, does he now, plan? Uh, sorry. sorry. Now yeah, I ahead. encourage him. Uh, he study hard. He want he to wanna get a um, license for drive a truck, CDL, CDL, mm -hmm. doesn't he? Yeah, truck. Yes. Yeah, drive a truck. The first uh, uh, test he passed. The second test, now he study hard about third test. <laughs> okay, great. great. Yes. And does he ever plan to, once he has sort of ha has working knowledge of English, does he ever plan to go back to accounting work or he's, he's happy with he'll, sort he'll of- He'll make more money as a truck driver. <laughs> <laughs> Not always about money. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna move on to the second part of, of our uh, evening here. Uh, what resources, websites, et cetera, can we use to share this information with people who are skeptical about the benefit of refugees in Connecticut? Well, Chris's agency has a, a, a great site to go and understand. You should talk yeah, about it. Yeah, you know, and I'm the only one who didn't thank you for organizing this conference. Uh, I apologize. Thank you. I mean, this is what it's about. It's, it's about education, educating people about refugees, refugee resettlement. Um, we cannot expect people in this country to support the refugee resettlement program if they don't understand it. And we can't, you know, blame them for not understanding it. It's our own fault. Refu 350 refugee resettlement agencies, we are pathetically behind in educating people. Very few refugee resettlement agencies do outreach and public education and and participate in forums like this. We need to catch up and do more of that. Um, so yes, jump on our website. That'll lead you to a host of other websites where you can learn about it. Um, organize public forums, organize receptions in your homes. Any group you're a part of, invite a refugee resettlement person to come and, and speak there. We have got to spread the word. So can I get a promise now from all of you that if we do another one like this, that you'll all show up I'm and there. do this great? We'll be on time. <laughs> let, let me just tell you one, one other story. I, you know, uh, uh, a couple of weeks after 31 uh, governors had signed on to block uh, refugees from coming to their states, uh, I was on a phone, uh, a telephone conference uh, call, um, and it was painfully obvious, e e even weeks after they had taken the stand, how little the governors themselves understood uh, about the process. Um, and um, they just had not taken the time or immersed themselves in the subject before they signed on to, to this uh, challenge that was basically laid down by the governor of, of, of Michigan of all states, um, and in the intervening weeks, with all of the controversy that, that was around it, they didn't bother to, to, to understand uh, the screening process. And so I'm, I'm on the phone listening um, to the Secretary of Homeland uh, uh, to, to trying to explain to these governors uh, what the process was. So this, this thing about you know, vetting, th these are the most vetted visitors um, uh, to the United States. And as I said on that conference call, and it's one reason that some governors don't like me, but I said, you know, you're, you're not calling for, a, I, you know, we, we've had more um, uh, challenges in Belgium and France, and, and, and remember this was the big, the, the big incident, uh, incidences that, that gave rise to this, this uh, rhetoric. 
Um, but all you need is an you know, EU passport, and you get to the United States with, without anybody asking many questions. Um, and um, you know, this is, at its very core, this is discrimination. That's, if, you, if, you, if you ever wondered that whether you were going to live in America where uh, leading politicians advocated discriminating against other individuals on the basis of religion, you live in that country. That's who we are now. Um, not us individually, but as a country. And that's how we're viewed by other countries. And our Canadian cousins, who are doing so much more than we are uh, in the regard to resettlement of uh, uh, immigrants, and particularly Muslim Im immigrants, um, are thinking ill of their cousins. Let me just add to that kind of, uh, we've been talking a lot about the, you know, the details of refugee resettlement and what we should do about specific populations. But kind of just going off of your comments, Governor, um, what the kind of macro risks are in the long term for this country. Right? Um, you know, I, I don't think people are, you know, people of any one particular country are born exceptional and that's what makes the country exceptional. Right? A country get, becomes great when it has great people. Right? And what's made America great for a couple of centuries is that it's been able to project an image that attracts the best and brightest from the entire world. Right? So some of the research that I you know, referred to in that video has to do with the fact that oh, you know, in the US, we are a leader in you know, high tech and science engineering. So that's the area that uh, we have a comparative advantage in, we create new products, new markets. Right? But a um, but lot of those new products, new markets, Nobel Prizes are not from people who are born in the United States, but they happen to be affiliated with, say, a U U.S. university, happen to be living here, running a business here, right? And now, if you're sending these signals that this is not a welcoming place, right, we're going to lose that talent, right? And the big risk is, maybe it's not next year, the big risk is not the security risk that happens this year or next year in Brussels or in Paris or or in New York, right? The big risk is in like in 20, 30 years, this is gonna show up in our economy. Okay. Let, let me add one other thing to this, and I, I get myself in trouble with some of my, our European co cousins when I talk about this, but uh, we also follow a, in the United States a very different model, which, which is not perfect, but we're, it's a far more inclusive model, um, uh, culturally speaking. Um, things like housing and housing patterns are very different for emigres uh, and refugees in the United States than they are in, in Europe. Um, this is by definition, even though we stumble from time to time, a much more open society and accepting society an integrated society. And so some of the, uh, some of the treatment on a broad-based cultural basis in, in some European countries that uh, emigres and particularly uh, Muslim emigres have been subjected to um, is not the norm in the United States, even though we're having a discussion about this abnormal behavior, um, is not the norm, and, and certainly not the norm in college towns and university towns and, and uh, um, uh, places that are more likely to be uh, inhabited by um, are the urban environments. Um, so I, I think that, that there's reason to be very hopeful that our past experience with immigration and refugees is a good predictor of a better outcome just as I think European experiences with refugees um, and, their and their integration um, has been reasonably predictive of some of the shortfalls of that system. And just on your note, um, uh, on your point, uh, Professor Mubarak, that, uh, that it will show up in our economy in 30 to 40 years. Um, there's also that aspect that we have the international community that, that takes our lead, that invests in our country. And, and if we start to close our doors uh, to what has traditionally been an open door policy in our country, what does that say in terms of our relationships with the international communi community? And some of those refugees, and I, and I don't quite know what the policies are in a place like Canada, but I imagine with Justin Trudeau that they're pretty open. A lot of that talent will then start to go elsewhere, like our competitor in Canada, right? Yeah, and in fact, uh, I mean, it's been a great boon for countries like Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, right, which offer many of the same services such as, if you're, if you're an English speaker, those are the first set of places that you think about, right? So I remember after 9-11, there was this Visa Mantis program 
that was instituted that made it much more difficult for foreign graduate students to come to U.S. universities, so especially in what they called, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, technically skilled areas like physics and engineering, right, where there might be security risks. And, and post 9-11, for the next few years, Australian universities, British universities were very happy they were getting much better much better students. And as soon as, uh, you know, America started projecting an unwelcoming image, right? So the president of France made uh, an English language video, which is blasphemous in France to, to do, <laughs> uh, saying that, oh, why don't Montreal you... Montreal, too. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, do, why, uh, uh, yeah, why don't American scientists come here, right? Um, so similarly, Canada has instituted policies that say, okay, if you want to shift over, say, from MIT to McGill, right, we're going to make it easy. And that's exactly the right, I mean, if I was running those countries, that's the strategy I would take as well, because it's high-skilled people, techni uh, technically able people, talented people that matter, right? Mm -hmm. but, I, I would, but, but I would still underline what Governor Malloy said, which is that, look, it takes a lot more than a video, okay? So now my wife and I, for the first time in our lives, we've considered leaving, given, uh, given the situ situation in this country over the past year, right? However, like when push comes to shove, when we look at, okay, what are the opportunities that UK universities are offering me or European universities are offering me, right? It turns out the US has a huge lead in this market, right? So it's, you know, like it does push us a little bit in that direction, but not enough to actually send us over the edge, right? Because uh, America has made a bunch of extremely smart decisions over the last 50, 60 years in the way that uh, rewards to talent has been set up here. Which is why we have to make sure that this is a short-lived exactly. experience. Exactly. Uh, we, we, can, we can overcome a short period of uh, this type of behavior, right. but, we can't, uh, but we'll do real harm if, if, we, uh, if we keep it up too long. Yeah, as, if you keep pushing us at some point. <laughs> right, right. Keep pushing well, me. It's, it's, it's uh, comforting to know that, that we're in the hands of great leaders like all of you. Sorry, Chris, you ha had a point? I, I have one more visual aid, and it, and it relates to the, the point that you made that, um, you know, the U.S. has traditionally been a leader. The U.S. has traditionally been a leader in resettling refugees, but um, if, if we abandon that role, and we lose influence and clout in international forums at the UN and, and, and meetings with heads of other states, we won't be able to encourage other governments to increase the number of refugees they, they resettle. I mean, if our numbers drop down, if we have a president who turns his back on an international agreement to bring 110,000 refugees to this country, how can we sit down with, you know, Australia or, or, or Belgium or, or maybe Canada, I don't know, and say, you need to resettle more refugees when we aren't doing as much as we can? That will drive more refugees to desperation. You've seen this horrible photograph. Risking their lives, trying to cross the Mediterranean, and drowning. Um, I mean... The impact that our decisions have will be felt across the world and will probably lead to a loss of life. So, you know, we, 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 we can't let this happen. We resettled in 2015 70,000 refugees. In 2016, it went up to 85,000. The President of the United States declared at the United Nations at the end of 2016 that the U.S. would bring 110,000 refugees to this country. Our current president has now turned his back on that promise. But not Connecticut. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to start the second part, um, and we'll keep it pretty short. I know we're kind of running out of time, but I think it's important to discuss the uh, recent um, uh, the recent ban on the Supreme Court decision. So, Justin. Yes. As I understand it, the impact for refugees from the recent Supreme Court ruling on the Muslim ban states that a refugee in the U.S. can claim concrete hardship, but ultimately, if they lack connection, as we spoke about before to the United States, 
The rule works against them and in favor of the government's need to provide for the nation's security. Can you please update us on where President Trump's Muslim ban stands in the courts right now? What are the possible outcomes and next steps for both of your organizations, IREP and NILC? Okay, so um, so Nilk, uh, along with the ACLU, we represent IRAP in the case, which is now called Trump v. IRAP. It started uh, IRAP v. Trump, which is a lot more fun. Um, but they switch it when you get to the Supreme Court. Um, and so our case has been consolidated with Hawaii's case. And the upshot is there are three provisions that are uh, now blocked to some extent. So you have, uh, and this is provisions of the March 6th executive order, Muslim ban 2.0. So you have uh, Section 2C, which blocks the entry of all nationals from, not all, well, blocks the entry of nationals from six particular, six Muslim majority countries. And then you've got two parts of Section 6, which are specific to refugees. So Section 6A suspends the United States Refugee and Admissions Program uh, for 120 days, and, and it blocks the entry of any refugees for those 120 days. And then a separate section of, uh, subsection of 6, uh, cuts the number of refugees, purports to cut the number of refugees who may be admitted this fiscal year from the 110,000 that was uh, that Chris referenced earlier to 50,000. So one kind of unique aspect of uh, of federal law having to do with refugees is that before every fiscal year, the president sets the number of refugees who may be admitted in the coming fiscal year. So. President Obama said that 110,000. Um, there's no provision in the law for that number to be changed retroactively. Nonetheless, that's what President Trump purported to do, cutting it to 50,000. So the Supreme Court's opinion uh, from Monday basically said that those three provisions can be enforced except as to uh, individuals who have some kind of bona fide connection to an American individual or entity. And so um, there's a fair amount of confusion about what that might mean. Um, but the upshot, I, the upshot of what it should mean is this. Basically, if you were going to come in, if like someone, anyone who was set to come in in the next three to four months from either one of the six countries or as a refugee should still be able to come in because virtually all of them, not all, but virtually all of them already have a connection to an American individual or, or entity. So if you're from one of the six countries, you're coming here, if you're coming here on a visa, there virtually all visa categories require a connection to the United States already. Um, so every immigrant visa, there is an American citizen or a green card holder who's petitioning for their relative to come. Um, every employment-based visa, there is an American employer who is uh, petitioning. Uh, every student visa, there's an American university who is attached to that. You know, the folks who are, who are going to get left out in the cold are going to be uh, tourists from these six countries who don't have a connection to the United States. Turns out we don't give a lot of tourist visas to these six countries anyway. Uh, but nonetheless, there are going to be people who are affected. Uh, and, you know, maybe folks who win the diversity lottery, uh, which is, you know, a total of, what, 10,000 people a year worldwide uh, sort of enter, enter a lottery and, and can get a green card to come to the United States. Um, but... Otherwise, if you're from, one, from the six countries, you probably already have a connection. When it comes to refugees, um, same thing. As Chris was saying, these resettlement agencies know well in advance who's coming. Uh, and there are, you know, the refugee resettlement pipeline is, as we've talked about tonight, you know, two, three, five years long. And there are people at various stages of this, right? And so there are enough folks who are at the end who now have a connection to an agency like uh, Chris's organization and others that um, that they should be allowed to come in during the next four period, notwithstanding uh, the court's order. Um, similarly, even, even if they're not all the way at the end, there are lots of other categories of refugees in the pipeline that have a connection to the United States. So, you know, the, uh, there are some 50,000 Iraqis uh, refugees who have a connection to the United States because um, they're being persecuted because of their faithful service to the United States uh, military or United States contractor during the invasion and war in Iraq. Um, there are some 10,000 uh, Syrian refugees who uh, are in a program that requires them to have a United States-based uh, relative. And so, and there are other such categories um, that of, of refugees who, as a categorical matter, have a connection to the United States. And so the practical effect of the court's ruling is that if you were, 
99%, 90, whatever, some huge percentage of the folks who would have gotten in in the next three or four months anyway are going to come in. They should be unaffected. But, and so for that reason, when you think, think of it that way, uh, it's kind of hard to understand how Trump can claim victory as he did, right? Um, on the other hand, think about it this way. These six countries have 180 million uh, nationals combined. There are roughly 65 million refugees in the world right now. And there's some overlap. But let's say more than 200 million people in the world right now are banned from entering the United States for the next three to four months. Some 97% of them are Muslim, maybe. Actually, no, that's not true. 97% of the 180 are Muslim. The refugees are, I think it's between 70 and 80% Muslim. But the vast majority of them are Muslim. 200 million Muslims are now banned from the United States. And that's why you have a lot of uh, Muslim organizations in particular saying, are particularly upset by this because we now have an immigration policy in this country for the next three to four months in which, under which 200 million people are banned because of their religion or because they are associated with uh, people of a particular religion because they happen to be of the same country. And so in that sense, you can understand why he call, he's claiming victory because it's never actually been about banning people, like actually keeping people out. It's been about telling his base that he banned Muslims because that's what he promised he was going to do. I mean, the whole thing, it's never made sense, right? Like the, um, you know, this, the, the seven countries were chosen not because they actually pose a particular risk. They were chosen because they were on a, a list that preexisted of, um, it's too complicated to get into, but basically he could blame it on Obama and say, you know, the Obama administration said these countries are dangerous. Um, and so um, that's why I'm doing it, not because they're Muslim. But that's like we know that's not true because Rudy Giuliani said it's not true. Right. Um, thank God for Rudy Giuliani, uh, <laughs> because like he sort of links all of this together. Um, but so that's where the, the case is right now is that the upshot is the president gets his Muslim ban. He gets to ban 200 million people who aren't going to come in anyway, but he nonetheless gets to claim victory. Um, we get, you know, the people who were going to come in, we should be able to, to help most of them get in. Um, and then in the fall, the, uh, you know, over the summer, we'll, we'll be briefing the case, uh, on the merits because the, the court said, in addition to sort of partially lifting the st the injunctions, they also said that they were going to he hear the cases on their merits. And so we have another round of briefing to do over the next, um, two to three months. And then in the fall, in October, actually, there will be oral argument at the Supreme Court uh, where we'll argue and Hawaii will argue and the Solicitor General will argue, uh, who's the, uh, the lawyer for the government um, who, who argues in the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court will decide something. Um, you know, I think that there's a decent chance by then that they'll say the entire case is moot. Um, because, you know, the whole point of the ban was to let the government do this study to make sure that, you know, the vetting procedures are, are adequate. Uh, and that those studies will be done by the time the Supreme Court hears the case. The bans will be over because by their own terms, they only last 90 to 120 days. Uh, and so I think that there's some chance the Supreme Court will just duck the issue entirely and say it's all moot. Um, but meanwhile, um, and this gets back to a question that I was asked earlier, uh, what sort of impact does all of this have on refugee policy and, uh, and you know, in particular as it relates to Connecticut? Um, as I mentioned, before every fiscal year, the president gets to say how many refugees get to come in. And so in September, President Trump is going to make his determination of how many uh, refugees uh, you know, I think the actual wording of the statute is something like uh, the number of refugees who, um, who, whose entry would be in the best interest of the United States or something like that. And so, um, you know, historically, over the last few years, we've, you know, resettled between 70 and 80,000 refugees. Um, but, you know, although President Trump can't legally cut that number after the fiscal year begins, like it is up to him to say what the number is for next year and the year after and the year after. And, you know, Congress um, consults, there are this consultation process that's required, but the ultimate decision is the president's. Um, and so I think that's obviously a concern uh, because President Trump um, doesn't seem to be uh, 
in favor of refugees and refugee resettlement. And so um, that's the that's what's next is, you know, what he sets that number at and then whether or not um, there's any way we can sue him over it. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of where we are right now. And I just have a quick question, mm -hmm. and, and anybody else can add to this. Are, are you working with big corporations like, for instance, Starbucks announced that they mm -hmm. would uh, employ, I think, 100,000 refugees after after the Muslim travel ban, and I think other companies are following suit. H how are big corporations helping move this forward and, and helping sort of mitigate some of some of this resistance towards refugees? What? I mean, in the litigation, I, I can talk about the litigation. I think Becca might be better positioned to talk about, um, or others, in sort of beyond that. But you know, certainly in the litigation, we've had an unbelievable response from um, corporate America in in the form of amicus briefs, which is um, where it's a friend of the court brief, where anyone can sort of weigh in with the court and say, like, here's our view of like what you may be overlooking or what you may not properly be valuing. Um, you know, at the at the Fourth Circuit, we had. Um, a tech company's amicus brief that was signed by like some 200 uh, major corporations, Google, Twitter, um, you know, like tw I actually tweeted something when, uh, right after the the Darwish uh, case when we filed it about the JFK, the folks being detained in JFK. I, I tweeted something about like, hey, if you want to like get in on the fun, you know, amicus briefs are due, whatever. And then like Twitter emailed me and was like, hey, we want to do an amicus brief. Um, <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, Becca, do you want to have anything to add about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, it's all the reasons that, that Professor Mubarak was discussing. I mean, you put up like eBay, Google, and I forget what the third one was. Tesla. Uh, that's the electric car, is it? Mm -hmm. um, are they safe yet? It's the only car to drive They're more in safe. the future anyway. Um, <laughs> when they lower the price a little. <laughs> but I, you know, I think that like corporations do things I often don't agree with, but they're, they're very efficient. And they understand that we need refugees and immigrants to continue coming into this country for them to continue to innovate and turn a profit and generate new products. So I think we've found that in a, in a variety of ways, you know, both not just as signing off on the litigation, but like Airbnb just launched a platform where if you're a refugee or an immigrant and you're stranded at an airport um, or you need a temporary place to stay, you can do that through the Airbnb platform and they're reimbursing the hosts mm -hmm. um, for allowing people to stay there. So there's all sorts of really amazing ways that I think corporations have stepped in to offer their particular service in service of this particular humanitarian issue. And sometimes it's in their interest. I, I sit on a council on the future of global migration with the World Economic Forum, you know, the Davos people. And so they, in that council, Those there's... Davos people. In that, in that council, there's, I mean, there's members from the government, but private sector, very impressive people uh, that I've uh, had a chance to now learn from and talk to. And so Western Union has one of their uh, executives on the council. And because, you know, allowing for or disallowing migration is really central to their business, right? Mm -hmm. Oracle has an executive there because, you know, they're really reliant on cross-border movements of, of talent, right? So the, these guys can be powerful allies that we should be trying to take advantage of and make use of. Great. Well, I'm going to ask one last question. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here again. But if there's one thing that you can recommend that we can do as attendees of this and as uh, citizens and residents of this country and in this state to move the needle forward, to help the dialogue uh, move forward, what would that be? Start maybe uh, one point each. <laughs> Don't get distracted by shiny objects. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> Right? I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Probably have to work on that that's, one. <laughs> that's generally true. Not just yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would encourage you all to have difficult conversations, uh, especially with white people, about um, immigration and immigrants and uh, why they should care and why they, if they're against either, they're they're wrong. <laughs> So it, it would be great for us to move the conversation from thinking about the security risks of refugees, because I don't think that's actually the big issue, to like what their economic characteristics are. We should be thinking about these people as economic migrants. And honestly, you know, I showed you, uh, you know, or I said things based on a lot of data that we have on immigrants. We really don't have great information yet 
on refugees, and that, that's not just refugees into the U.S., but large refugee populations that are in Lebanon or, um, or in Bangladesh, at the Bangladesh-Myanmar border, right? And we need to gather much better information on what the economic characteristics are. You know, are these guys positively selected? Do they have lots of assets? Do they have lots of human capital, right? And that's, you know, we should be thinking about the opportunities here as opposed to just the cost. Please do not call refugees economic migrants. Please don't. There are huge political and legal implications for doing that. Thank you. Um, similar to Justin's uh, uh, suggestion, I would say, you know, I, I spend most of my time preaching to the converted. So what I'd like for you to do is find people, maybe groups of people, large groups of people, relatives, friends, who are not convinced that we should be resettling refugees and invite Bushra and me to speak to them. All right? Bushra? Oh. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so she said, like, um, I don't afraid to be, uh, to ask us any questions, approach us, we're accepting any questions. This is what she wanted to do. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you again to our panelists. We can give them a big hand. Special thanks again to Yale McMillan, to Marilyn for helping us put this together. Thank you so much. Um, and I uh, just want to uh, make quickly the point that Beacon and Maine will be hosting many more forums on various tops, uh, topics and issues that affect our daily lives socially and economically. So please, if you haven't done so already, sign up on our mailing list. You can learn more about us and upcoming events at beaconandmaine.org. Uh, we are a small state in Connecticut with a big heart and a tremendous amount of intellect, and together we certainly can make a difference, and we are. Thank you. Thank you so much.